Today is our last week in the series in the book of Daniel, and in fact, the Old Testament. And so this, uh, this passage we're going to read is Daniel chapter 7. It's going to shift today, though, because the literature, the, the style is going to uh, change dramatically. Yeah, it's going to become apocalyptic. Uh, ap- apocalyptic movies are kind of a big thing right now, too. Yeah. Like, anyone seen the newest Mad Max? Mad, no. Nope. Um, Anyone ashamed that you didn't raise your hand, but you yeah, did yeah, see it? Yeah, you just yeah. are not sure. Can I really raise my hand for that in here? Uh, yeah, so things like Mad Max or any, I don't know, Geostorm or uh, the ending of Toy Story 3. You know, this sort of like <laughs> the end of the world is happening. Um, and so it's kind of, it's going to get a little bit crazy, but hang, hang in there with us. We're going to kind of decipher how to read this exactly. And I believe it's popular apocalyptic movies and so forth, and the list goes on. If you really think about it, you think about the hype around certain movies, The Hunger Games and others, where people are like, yeah, yeah, end times. In fact, in the church, this is a big thing in many (laughs) circles. We get together and we want to interpret scripture to give us an idea of what the end times are going to look like. Jesus himself addressed this. He said, said, there'll be some signs, there'll be some things that will show you that, yeah, the, you are in the last days. But he wrote about that. The apostles wrote about that 2,000 years ago. Imagine growing up and living in Western Europe in 1939 uh, as Nazism was marching across the continent. Uh, I think that prophecy and scripture would have even taken on more meaning. But So this morning, we're going to kind of take a, a look at this and then walk away with some, hopefully some helpful, helpful uh, points. So yeah. let's, let's pray real quick. Pray. Father, thanks for... Uh, Thanks for your word. We look into your word. We just settle down and uh, let your word speak to us. We posture ourselves as learners, not as people who want to cherry pick what we like out of your word, but we, we let your word speak to us. We realize your word is perfect and eternal and we are flawed in our understanding. So just speak to us where we're at. Catch us where we're at this morning, we pray. Yeah, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So chapter seven, verse one. Here we go. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea and four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first beast was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. We're getting weirder. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Whoa, man. Right. <laughs> it's, it's when crazy. I read this, all I can think of is those Transformer toys, you know, <laughs> that the kids play with. It's a car that turns into a robot or a monster or it stands up right, on right. its hind legs, you know. Yeah. And, and so this is what you have. You have all this imagery but um, there's an interpretation that comes with this. And again, Daniel's, if you remember, if you've been tracking with us, Daniel's been dreaming all along. And those dreams have pretty much all come true for him in relation to the authority that he was under. Daniel has survived several kings. Nebuchadnezzar was the king and the kingdom that took him into captivity, Babylon. Babylon now is gone, and now he's under the king of the, of the Medes and the Persians, this guy named Darius, and, and, and so forth. And so Daniel is hitting a hundred, he, he's batting a, a, a thousand, in here, everything he's dreamed has come to pass, but now he gets a dream that seems to be bigger and broader and farther than any of the other ones. So the interpretation. Before we get to that, I I think we have to just be careful about how we read these things, because this is really easy for, say, um, cults can really mess with people who want to 
read and believe the Bible. Because what they can do is they can take some of this imagery and say, well, what this really means is, and they'll start tying it into, I don't know, Obama. You ever seen these things on Facebook, maybe? You know, and you're like, ooh, what if that word really means this other thing? Every president's been the Antichrist but <laughs> in somebody's book <laughs> right. yeah. for the last 50 years. <laughs> you know, or it's like, oh, the, like the triangle is really a sign for the Illuminati, you know, or like, or it's just a yield sign, right? So, <laughs> so there's that kind of like, we, we have to be... <laughs> We have to be careful about this. And so what we have to do is, we, uh, I guess, think of it a little bit more like a political cartoon. Because like Bruce was saying, these aren't actual, these aren't transformers. It's a little more like he's seeing what we, we, we know as symbolism, right? Like when we see this comic, what do you see? You see the Republicans and the, Dem the Democrats blaming each other, right? But imagine to someone who, who wasn't from our culture, they'd be like, I saw before me a large elephant on its hind legs mm. with a mouth the shape of a human hand pointing at a donkey adversary. You know, you're like, what? This is crazy. But, <laughs> but really, so what we're going to get here is a little bit of the, the symbolic truth of what's going on. So Daniel gets this interpretation, and then we're going to read this. It's a little bit odd, but hang with us, and then we'll, we'll, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll have some application here. So I, Daniel... When I saw these things, I was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of these standing and asked him the meaning of all this, and he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four beasts are the four kings that will rise from the earth. The holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest and most terrifying. Iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others, that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people, defeating them. Until the Ancient of Days came, and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. And he gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth, different from all the other kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue the three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people, and try to change the set times and laws, and the holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. And the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale. But... I kept the matter to myself. <laughs> Just such an odd ending. Like, what? <laughs> uh, and so what you have here, in many parts of the Old Testament, you're going to find that there are prophecies and dreams that are given that seem uh, odd, of course, but they have like a dual significance. And almost every scholar would agree to this, that um, there was application in the historical context in which they were given, but there's also application in future contexts, and what we have here is exactly that. Uh, a common example of this would be, how many of us love the scripture out of Isaiah chapter nine, unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given, and the government will be upon. Well, we love that, we, that's our Christmas scripture. And that very much, I believe, was about the Messiah. But that was also written to a current period of time in which Isaiah lived that had to do with those rulers. There was a son that was born to a ruler and so on and so forth. And so there's this crossover there's this prophetic dual application, and you find that in a lot of places in the Old Testament, and this is one of those examples, but it does have a historical explanation. Yeah, so the, horse, the historical application here would be that these four kings, uh, scholars believe, uh, first of all, the first king that shows up, the, the lion, would be Babylon, so where, uh, where Daniel is currently at the time. Um, you know, and the lion represents strength and majesty, you know, has wings like an eagle, so it's, very, it's, it's speedy and powerful. Uh, the, the, the bear is the Medo-Persian Empire, which kind of 
showed up, kind of combined powers and wasn't done conquering. It kind of took over Babylon in the process. And so sort of the raise up on one side maybe suggests the unequal power of the two countries combined. Um, and I know, I'm not sure if kids are still in here, but if this is too graphic, we can always turn down the, uh, yeah, there we go, that's better. Um, the, the third beast was, I'm sorry, it's dumb. Uh, the third beast was, was the leopard with four heads and four wings. Uh, so it's ferocious, it's fast, it's, the four wings means it's even faster. And so they believed that this was Alexander the Great who uh, conquered essentially the, the known world by age 32. <laughs> In 10 years, he took down the whole Persian empire. So any of our young adults feeling like you're not off the ground yet, it's okay. You, <laughs> It's amazing yeah. what 10 years can do to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the fourth one, the, the, this kind of beast that we, has never been seen before is the Roman Empire. Uh, and, and some of this horn stuff is about the, the 10 different emperors that would last over time. But again, like what Bruce was saying about the dual significance thing, I mean, you can imagine being in, you know, because some of this is like, well, this is specifically what it is, but it's also kind of a faint image of what bad kingdoms kind of look like as the future progresses, because clearly a lot more awful things have happened since this time. I can imagine if, if we were around when Nazi Germany was starting to take over and launching world wars, it's like, I'd be reading Revelation like, dude, I think this is the end, <laughs> right? Like, mm -hmm. it's like, like, what kind of beast would you use to describe that kingdom? Um, but yet that wasn't the end either. And so we, we kind of have, it's kind of like when you, when you have one bad boss, you know, like, oh man, my boss is the worst, you know him by name. And then later on in life, you meet kind of a new one, you're like, oh, I've seen you before. I know your type. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, there seems to be kind of this, the, it, there's a, that dual meaning is this sort of hazy caricature of what, mm -hmm. of what will come as well. And what you have here, Jesus himself would describe in Matthew 24. He warned as he, as he ended his life, as his life came to an end, he said, you are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end isn't yet. Nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Famines, earthquakes in various places, all these are the beginning of birth pains. And so Jesus likened this, this developing dynamic as to a woman who slowly goes into labor and the pain becomes greater and more frequent. But the crazy thing is, is that pain is going to give birth to a totally new thing. And that's... I, I've, honestly, as I was studying this this week, it's actually very reassuring when you think about it because often when we see the, the rumors of wars, you're kind of like, man, what's going to happen? You know, it's like everything seems to be getting worse. But you can imagine for a pregnant woman, you know, more and more birth pangs, she's not going, oh, something's wrong. Like, this is just getting worse and worse and worse. You're like, no, this is, this is normal. You're going to give birth. Like, this is a, unfortunately a part of the process, but the, but the end of this is glorious. And so we shouldn't be surprised when there are uh, famines or earthquakes or false saviors or when we're hated by all nations for Christ's namesake or lawlessness is increasing or love growing cold. These are all things Jesus talked about in terms of these things have to happen before the end comes. But I love verse 13 and 14. I'm not sure how far you had it there in the, on, the, on the slide. But the one who stands firm to the end, Jesus said, will be saved and the gospel of this kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. And so this ending of Daniel, this ending of our Old Testament series is really an ending of hope. Hope is a precious commodity today because in a nation or a world or a life where God is no longer on the, on the throne or no longer in the equation, and my hope is in science, my hope is in economics, my hope is in politics, man, it is really a nation or a person ripe for despair. Because when you look around and you put your hope in those things and you see those things turn dark, and it's not, you don't have to look very far to see those things. Men, it's no wonder that suicide is one of the leading causes of death from 15 to 25 in the young people in the Western world. Not just the US, but the Western world. One of the leading causes of death is self-destruction. Because self-destruction makes sense to me if I've arrived at a place in my life where there is no hope and there is no future. The message we carry in the gospel is a message of hope. And so Daniel gets an interpretation on this dream, I want to read this passage as we kind of come in for a landing here. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. We skip this part. It's in the middle. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. 
His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Does that sound like familiar? Like, did we just read that somewhere? (laughs) John the Revelator, centuries later, would pen the same words. The court was seated, the books were open. I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. And in my vision I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. These words were written over 500 years before Jesus Christ appeared on the scene. Daniel uses this imagery of, he describes this this being, this son of man, that will appear on clouds. Let your Sunday school mind run a little bit and try to imagine, have I ever seen this before, the cloud thing? Has God ever like appeared in a cloud? Oh, I remember when Moses was chasing the Israelites and they got to the edge of the river or they got to the edge of the Red Sea and they had nowhere to go and all of a sudden what appeared? A cloud appeared and stood before Moses and the Egyptians. And oh, and there was this other time where Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments and God spoke out of a, you can say it, cloud. Cloud was this thing of the presence of God. And he says, the son of man is going to come somehow this, in this, on this cloud. Mm-hmm. And he goes on to say, he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence, this, this son of man. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And again, this is, I mean, you can imagine, America's been around for what, 200 plus years now? I mean, this, this was written and, and lived for 500 plus years. And then one day, the historical man named Jesus shows up in Mark 14, and the high priests are asking him, hey, who do you say that you really are? Mark 14, 61 says, are you, the, the high priest asks Jesus, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Jesus says, I am. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. He, so even though this, this dream was given to Daniel about these upcoming four empires, there seems to be this thing of like, uh, this, this Jesus figure is going to, like someone's going to show up and, and be this person. Jesus is claiming, I am that person. Now it's interesting, those words, what Jesus said, were the trigger that caused the empire to crucify him. Jesus was crucified by the empire, the Roman empire, the fourth beast. Now you can go on, chapters eight through 12, talk about a whole bunch of other things and we could spend decades trying to dissect those things but what we wanna focus on is this last piece here that this empire, the clash of the empires. Now an empire can have different angles to it, it can have different faces to it. All, many of us have known or seen a empire that is, its power is rooted in its military. Uh, a military empire uh, that has weaponry, that has numbers of soldiers, that has advanced technology, and they rule people with their military. You can look around at several nations in the world today that are military juntas. They're, they're ruled by the power of force. And that, that, those people are subjugated by that force. You want an example? Think North Korea, right? It is ruled by the military. And if that military disappeared, the nation would change rather yeah, quickly. Where, where does an 800 pound gorilla sit? <laughs> Anywhere it wants, yeah. The second, the second power that we're doing here of, uh, of, of earthly kingdoms. You, I had to think about that a second. Uh-huh. Like, why would he ask me that right That's now? <laughs> I, just, I was thinking a lot about animals, and I just yeah, had this yeah. thought. The imagery, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the second power is economic power. And, and, and what we're after here is basically, sorry, the, the whole first point we're trying to get at here is we have to distinguish between the empire of the state and the empire of the kingdom of God. We have to kind of, we, since we live in this dual world or we live for the kingdom to come, but we are living here in this kingdom right now, we have to distinguish, okay, what, what am I living by? Am I living by the, just solely by, you know, where is this getting blurred? And so how can we separate this? And, and so one of the things earthly kingdoms rule by is economic power, money talks. Um, you can imagine if, uh, 
if China just decided to stop making anything our There'd Christmas. There'd be nothing to get in Walmart this Christmas. I, we would be financially ruined. Walmart would be likely. empty. Yeah. But wealth influences the nations. Yeah, the almighty dollar. We talk about the almighty dollar. Uh, the third one uh, uh, influences an empire of political, a political empire. Uh, and, and perhaps um, that would be a democracy. That would be an empire built on a government for the people, by the people, and so on and so forth. But that democracy or that empire has built itself up into a political power in the world. Uh, we have the ability to influence. We have the ability to sway elections. Just saying. We have the ability to, to, uh, to maybe... Um, build an allied base or build a, a base of enemies, but it's a political power. Mm -hmm. The fourth one is ideological, which almost seems odd, but it's true. Um, thoughts and ideas are a big deal. And, and we're seeing that play out a lot right now with this whole free speech debate, right? Because it's like, hey, freedom of speech, but then someone like Ben Shapiro shows, shows up on a campus and it's like, we're going to burn this place down because we can't let you say your thoughts and ideas. These are... These are are, are, are poison to our society, right? Um, I mean, just, uh, I think Carl Jung said, people don't have ideas, ideas have people. And if you don't believe that, try going on Facebook sometime and just posting your own thoughts and ideas about anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and just see do what a little the pushback experiment. is. Yeah, just see like, hey, I think, I don't, just say, I don't think there should be any laws on guns at all, you know? And like, that's an interesting idea. And you're gonna get a lot of ideological pushback because of that, right? I'm not trying to pick sides here by any means, but I'm just saying this, our, the, the way we think and want things to be is a huge deal. We label those empires as political correctness or, or groupthink or some, something like that. And, and so it's interesting that these empires, these four things, all have the ability to control or manipulate or influence people. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, right? So what, what is it? Uh, what is the empire that, is, that we are living for? Do you, any of you guys been around a long time in the church? You remember this song? This world is not my home. I'm just a... Pa uh, right? I can see some of you start to nod your head right away. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I... Don't feel at home in this world anymore. You can almost start just tapping your feet to that. That was a really well-known song written in the 1960s and sold millions and millions of copies and, uh, and sung all over the church. Because for the last few decades, the church has talked about and, and prayed about and, and declared that this world is not our home. And there was a, some great theological truth there. We want to leave you with three things quickly here. We have to, number one, distinguish between the empire of the state and the empire of the kingdom of God because it's easy to blur those lines. And what we're doing right now is we're wrapping up the last seven weeks. So if you're a note taker, listen carefully. But a few weeks ago, we talked about this, that we are citizens of the US or you're a citizen of Brazil, whatever your passport is, you were, you're a citizen of something because you were born somewhere and that makes you a citizen. So it doesn't matter where you were born, you are a citizen, I am a citizen to a political structure somewhere, somehow. And in that structure, I have certain responsibilities, there are certain laws, and I also hopefully have certain privileges that go with that empire. But ultimately, we are citizens of a bigger kingdom, of an eternal kingdom, of a larger kingdom, and we have to make that distinction or the lines are blurred. And I think we can't be blind to the fact that every day intentionally or not, the system is interested in pressuring us to conform to be more like it. Whatever the current ideology, political correctness, economic or, or military thing of the day, they, it, it's going to want us to fit into its mold. And we have to be careful that every day, every day we wake up, just as we sort of check the weather, like, what's the weather going to be like? How am I going to dress for it today? If, if we're not careful, we can look and like, what's society saying today? How, what do I need to be careful about what to say or not to say? And, and, and we can kind of start to just slide right into it. Uh, 1 John 2, John writes, do not love the world or anything in the world. And that, that word world is very much sort of the system that, that mm. operates. It's sort of the, the gears that are all moving and grinding in the world to kind of keep the money flowing, um, keep, keep the idolatry going. And he says, if anyone loves the system, loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, 
but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Stare at that for a second, would you? What he's describing, John described 2,000 years ago, is our struggle. Because we, you and I, have to do business, so to speak, all business in this world. I have to raise my children. I have to work. I have to literally do business. I have to function. And John is saying that there is a system in this world called this cosmos that is an antichrist system. I really believe the antichrist is going to be a person, but the antichrist is a system. It is against the kingdom of God in all of its forms. And sometimes when you wrap the cross in the flag of a nation, the lines get blurred very, very quickly. And we can end up doing antichrist things in the name of of the kingdom of God. If you don't believe me, just look over the last 200 years of our culture. It was the Christian South in the 1800s that supported slavery using Bible verses. It's a Christian nation that in 1973 allowed prayer to be taken out of a public school. It was a few years later, it was a Christian nation that legalized the murder and slaughter of a million babies a year. We have to face the fact that we are citizens of a bigger kingdom that will outlast the kingdom of this nation we live in. I'm not anti-US, I'm not anti-flag, please don't go there with me. But we we have to be true. We have to watch where those lines go. We have to be careful and discerning because if Daniel struggled with it, we struggle with it. And so the second thing is we have to recognize Not only is all mankind sinful, and the answer is not political, but the cross that we sang about, but God's grace is at work in every culture. And so in our culture, the United States has been a huge blessing to the nations of the world. The United States has been a huge part, I believe, of God's plan over the last hundred years or so to influence the nations. God's common grace is in every nation. Think about it that God used the dirt of heathen Egypt to grow enough wheat to save the modern world at that time. The dirt was heathen Egypt that that wheat was grown in, but God used it because God is a God of the whole world and he's gonna preach the gospel to the whole nation, to all the nations. And that's, that's an interesting sort of duality at hand is that on one hand, God uses godly people to bless an, odd, an ungodly kingdom, right? He used Daniel to bless that kingdom. But on the other hand, he sometimes uses ungodly kingdoms to bless godly people. Uh, you think about um, King Cyrus, uh, once he became uh, ruler, he actually allowed Daniel and his, and his pals to leave and return home and even kind of sponsored rebuilding their temple for them. It's like, that's amazing. Like, that's, a, that's an answer that, that this 70 years of exile is over and we can return to our homeland because of an ungodly nation. And that's why Daniel is the archetype of the believer for us in this series. Because Daniel, in spite of what his enemies were doing, continued to keep his eyes on the God who had called him, even in a place of exile, continued to function as a follower of Yahweh. And Daniel died, never having seen the return to the land. Daniel died in exile. So Daniel died with his eyes on a far off prize. But he died Because the prize was not his own return. The prize was being faithful to his God. The prize was being faithful to his God. So this last one is the simple one that says the only empire that is forever is the kingdom of God. Remember the dream? The only empire that is eternal is the empire of the kingdom. Worship team can come up. But the dream, remember the dream it started it started with Babylon. Babylon was, the, was the, one of the wonders of the ancient world, the hanging gardens of Babylon. There's an artist's rendition of ancient Babylon, and it had architecture. The walls of the city of Babylon were somewhere around 40 feet thick. Chariots could ride on top of the walls. There was uh, uh, um, architecture and education and culinary arts and astronomy and science, all kinds of advancements were there in Babylon. Today, Babylon looks a little bit more like this, modern day Iraq. It's a pile of rocks that the nations in the Middle East have been fighting over since the time of Daniel. You ever heard someone say, you don't wanna be on the wrong side of history? 
That's kind of what this looks like. On one hand, Babylon could probably say to its followers, you don't want to be on the wrong side of history. Babylon, we're taking over. And they were right for a time, but no kingdom can last forever. Mm. And that's what we see here. Even uh, with, with uh, uh, the Persian Empire, there's another uh, rendition of it as well. And then today there's just traces of it in Iran. The Greeks ruled the modern world. Alexander the Great ruled and Socrates spoke from the pantheon here in ancient Greece. People came from all over the world to hear the wisdom of the Greeks. No offense if you're Greek here this morning, but Greece is a mess right now. And in that place is, again, a pile of old rocks, right? And Rome, who would have ever thought that Rome could fall? Rome explored and built roads into every corner, niche and corner of the modern world of that day. North of Ireland and south towards India, Rome ruled the world. Who would have ever thought that Rome would ever fall? Our kids were stationed in Rome on a job assignment. My wife and I went over and I was just shocked. There's a lot of old stuff in Rome. Doorknobs and rocks. <laughs> there is no kingdom that's going to outlast the kingdom of God. And the writer John, from a place of exile in Patmos, I'm going to end with where we began. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Isn't it interesting that our culture wants to sell us everything under the sun as this is, this is eternal. This is, the last, this is the last iPod you're ever going to need. I knew you were going to go there. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the last education. This is the last degree you'll ever need. This, there's this utopian spirit that says, we're going to get someplace where we finally have enough. Peace at last. And all of history screams, it's not true. It's just simply not true. John would see this vision of a holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them they will be his people and God himself will be with them and he will be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain why? for the old order of empires has passed away and every once in a while we get a glimpse it's like we get a whiff of heaven we get a glimpse of it, just, and it's fleeting, and sometimes it causes us to lift our hands in worship, and then we're just back in this grind of life of the empire. Yesterday morning, I had arguably one of the best times of life as a pastor is when you're standing on a stage, and there's a room full of people, and next to me is a young man waiting for his bride to appear at the back door. And those doors open, and this bride who has been waiting her whole life shows up and he makes eye contact with her and at that moment I can hear his heart beating out of his chest. There's nothing like it. It'd be too awkward to take a picture but that his face is frozen <laughs> in my mind as he looks at this woman and there is no one else in the room. None of their struggles matter. None of the challenges, none of their character flaws, none of it matters. This groom is focused on this beautiful bride and the moment has come. John sees the groom, this Christ who has been waiting in the wings of history, crucified by the empire, basically died in obscurity, but millions upon millions of people have called him Lord, waiting for that wedding day when he looks at the bride says the time has come and the old order of things has passed away that's our hope that's your hope that's what we live for and meanwhile we bless the empire we bless the empire we don't curse it we bless it we pray let your kingdom come let your will be done on my part of the earth as it is in heaven 
that's a responsible follower of Jesus. I don't curse my empire. I bless it because God is bigger and he is worthy. So we're going to take communion. A symbolic reminder of what Jesus did on the cross. We didn't even ask for it, but he did it for us as a gift. And he offers it freely to anyone who will accept it. So in a moment, um, feel free to come on up, grab a little cup of juice, cracker, return to your seats, and after that, we'll take together.